Up next is an inspiring young man whose goal was actually to make it absurdly easy for entrepreneurs to do good, make a change in their work and in their lives. David Goldberg is the founder and global CEE, CEO of Founders Pledge. And since the launch in 2015, David has raised more than $450 million in nearly 1,300 different pledges across 30 countries. Welcome, David. We're so glad to have you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to call out SPS for doing and Roger and, and the curators here is that we have 14 women speaking today and only eight men. So I applaud you for having a, a very gender diverse group of speakers. Too often I go to conferences and it's a group of men sitting and talking about their white male privilege. And I, I'm really glad that we have women represented here. Um, so my name is David Goldberg. I'm the founder and CEO of Founders Pledge. We are a charity um, and we're trying to solve tough problems using coordination. Um, but before I tell you about Founders Pledge, I'm gonna tell you about me. It's sort of crucial to this story and we've heard a lot about journey today. So this is my journey. Um, so we have a, a, a timeline back in the day and now. Um, that's me and my dog Brian. And, um, and I'm gonna start at the important part. Um, so in 2008, I sold a small business that I started in Berlin. Um, and it wasn't a sexy tech business, but it was a business that I'd bootstrapped and made quite a bit of money selling. Um, and after that, I suddenly had more money than I knew what to do with. So I wanted to give some of it away to charity. And like Fran and like Christina, this was a new thing for me. I figured, uh, you know, as a smart-ish, rational person, giving to charity should be really easy. And so I went on this sort of quest to find great charities that I thought I could give money to effectively, and the results were sort of horrifying. It's everything that you fear about charity and hope isn't true, but turns out to be, right? So intentional opacity, no clear causal relationships, no evidence, lots of great pictures and anecdotes and stories, but nothing that I could really hang my hat on and say, my money is gonna do something, and that something is this. Um, it was really frustrating. So frustrating that I decided to go to university for the first time to figure out actually what does system change look like. So I ended up at UCLA doing a couple of degrees there um, and then um, made my way to the UK to do a PhD. And I was at Cambridge um, in the International Relations Department, um, really intellectually stimulated, and learning about great theory, but nothing that was really practical. And, um, and late one night, um, as, as one is wont to do, late at night I went to TED. And I saw a great TED Talk, two great TED Talks, in fact, one by Dan Pallotta, and the basic premise is charity is broken, and then one by Jennifer Polka, which was about charity can be fixed, using technology to scale impact. And I was so inspired that I dropped out the next day. And, um, and that took me on a journey where I actually met Fran um, in my first endeavor. So I wanted to start something that matters, and I'm gonna get back to the start something that matters. Um, that's what my talk is gonna be about. Um, and now we're here. I'm giving a talk at SPS. So I'm going to paint a picture of the world first that sort of should frame all of our discussions today. This is what the world is like. 21,000 people die every day of hunger. Every day. 65 million people, actually more now, are forcibly displaced from their homes. 836 million people suffer from neglected tropical diseases every year. These are not the sexy tropical diseases where you drill a well and it's all better. These are the, the dirty, horrible, you don't want to talk about tropical diseases. And 1.5 billion people live in extreme poverty their entire lives. That's crazy. And yet against this backdrop, we only have one Elon Musk. That's crazy to me. So whether or not you like Elon's politics or you like what he's doing, he's fundamentally trying to address social problems using markets and doing it in a way that most people aren't. Um, and he's making a lot, a lot of money in the process. So I want to go from one Elon to nine. Maybe not just nine, maybe 81. Or maybe not just 81, but 256. I want to see a world in which there are more great entrepreneurs starting social businesses. Now, so I left university, wanted to do something that mattered, and th that was sort of the framing of, of that journey. 
entrepreneurs solve problems was my basic hypothesis, right? So if entrepreneurs solve problems, then the way that I had thought that we could address this in the first instance was support social entrepreneurs who are using technology to scale impact. Lovely idea. So what that meant practically was we have social entrepreneurs and we were going to try to help them become more commercially viable. This was through a network called Founders Forum, which is an incredible network of tech entrepreneurs who had become very successful, but not particularly social. So I got brought on to help create this shift within social enterprise. And that meant a combination of money and support and a couple of other things. Um, and I'll cut to the chase. It didn't work. It was a, an unqualified failure. We gave away a million pounds in cash to 20 social businesses and nothing good came of it. Um, and it, it helped me, uh, well it made me sort of reevaluate my hypothesis. And I changed that hypothesis to the best entrepreneurs solve big systemic problems. So if the best entrepreneurs are solving big, big systemic problems and making money doing so, um, we need more Elons first, obviously. Um, and second, we should be working with the best social with the best commercial entrepreneurs. And instead of um, you know the other way around where you help the socially minded become more commercial, let's help the best commercial entrepreneurs to be more social. Let's help them to embed social impact. And that's what became Founders Pledge. And this is, this is the journey that I'm on and the journey that I'm asking founders to take as well. So what actually is Founders Pledge? At its core, it's an if-then statement. It says, if you make money selling your business as an entrepreneur, founder, investor, or VC, then you donate a small percentage of what you make to the charities or social causes of your choice at that point. It's a really simple premise, sort of like pay it forward, except pay it forward, but you're legally bound to pay it forward. Um, and the idea is that if we can get entrepreneurs to commit to give back before they have any money, then the future discount of that wealth is so sufficient that they're going to give more than they otherwise would have. And we can start a conversation today that means that when they have capital, they will have more information than I did, than Fran did, than Christina did, so that they're, they're starting from further along. So we thought about this a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. And we've iterated as well. So we're a charity, but we operate a bit like a technology company. We're a startup. We're lean. We're mean. Um, we iterate a lot. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you about sort of the basics and, and why this has worked in the way it has. So we've created flexibility. It allows founders, investors, and VCs to decide to give now and then figure out how to give later, select the recipients later, deploy capital later. It's about making the commitment and locking in your intent. Um, we give founders complete control. I'd be crazy if I tried to tell a group of entrepreneurs what to do. I don't intend to, um, and that's not our role. We allow founders to give to any nonprofit anywhere in the world. If it, doesn't if it doesn't exist yet, we'll help them to start it. We don't have a list of charities that entrepreneurs can pick from. It literally is any, any, any nonprofit anywhere in the world. And it's streamlined. It's not tied to equity, no impact on shareholders, doesn't touch the cap table. It means it's a, a, a personal decision and one that can be made in minutes as opposed to weeks or months. So. What does that mean? Why do founders actually pledge? So we can fit this into three buckets. Bucket one is it's a commitment mechanism. This is the easiest part. But the one that we're probably most well known for is I go around the world. I travel about six months a year. I practically live in London, but technically, you know, I live between airports and hotel rooms. Um, I get people to commit legally. I put them on the spot. I have a very high level for uncomfortable situations. It's my unique gift. Um, Zero shits are given, really. Um, but we're creating a forcing function for entrepreneurs to start this journey. And, we, and, and, and I, I, I have some notes. Journey is the thing that was mentioned six or seven times in the first talk. Um, and it's about peers and partners and, and, and solving our biggest problems. So this journey is super important as a commitment mechanism. Um, and here's someone who thinks that it's important as well, Sam Altman, the, the president of Y Combinator, the world's best tech accelerator. You can read the quote, but I'll read it for you. Many of our founders ask us about how they can donate part of their equity or post-exit proceeds, and now we have an answer. Founders Pledge. Awesome. So, number two, community. This is about that group of peers. It's about going on this journey together. So beyond just telling people to commit, we get them to come together 55 times a year across our events, and those are dinners, workshops, forums, field trips, pizza nights, and a whole host of other opportunities. We had a dinner last night here in Stockholm with about 17 entrepreneurs. Um, and it's about learning, starting conversations, and connecting. Because this isn't a journey that we take alone. This is a journey that we take together. 
And I think that we're much more than the sum of our parts. You know, we're bringing together groups of entrepreneurs with the same value alignments and giving them a common language to talk about how to fix big problems. And here's some of the people that are involved. You'll notice some, some names that, you, that, that are common. Uh, WeWork, Klarna, Blockchain, Uber, Common Bond, LendUp, Zopa, Flipper, Supercell, Y Combinator. There's a ton of them. Um, and they span 30 countries. There's some social proof now. And third, support. This is the most important thing that we do. It's really easy to give to charity, it turns out. All of you could do it right now on your phones before my talk finishes. You could take out your phone and you can Google best charity for X, and you'd have thousands of search results. And you can click through to one of them, find one that looks sexy and there's great pictures and that sort of hits you in the gut, and you can donate with a couple of clicks. Easy to do that, super difficult to give well. So our thesis is that it's not just enough to give, we need to give more effectively. So we have put together a pretty incredible team of researchers and sociologists and mathematicians and statisticians that work exclusively for our pledgers on a no-cost base to help them with charity sourcing, vetting, quantitative research, um, and diligence. We're helping entrepreneurs to give in a more effective way using more data, more evidence, and more tools than they'd be able to do on their own. And best of all, we provide a free global donor advised fund. We're the only one in the world that does this. And this is because I get these three questions a lot. I want to help. I don't know how. Like, Fran, you Google, how do you give to charity? I think that was, that was the, 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 the search question. Well, this is common. Founders everywhere have this issue. So these are the three questions I get most. What are the most important problems? What are the best solutions? And can you even trust the charities themselves? I talk to hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs per year. And these are three common questions. So we help them, and we do it for free. We have a no bullshit, 100% pass-through model. There's no cost, no fees, no commissions, no cuts ever. We don't ask for money, and we don't accept it from our pledgers. It's free, the only free lunch in town. And we can do this because we have a small group of pretty incredible philanthropists, um, some tech founders, some not, that cover all of our core operating expenses, so we can deliver this for free for everyone else. So we can lower the barrier to entry so far that it's super easy to step over for any entrepreneur. Those are people like Dustin Moskowitz, who co-founded Facebook, and Neil Hutchinson, who founded the Ford Internet Group, and Silicon Valley Bank, and Cooley, and a couple of others. And what that's meant is this. In three years, we have now more than 1,300 pledges, and we've raised $540 million for charity. Not 450, it's gone up in the last two weeks. Um, $540 million for charity. That's been across 51 exits and 82 million deployed. That's in three years. We're doing something right, um, but it's not enough to just get people to give. It's about giving better. So what? As I said earlier, giving to charity is easy, but doing good really well is hard. And we can help. So the one th I want to come back to this. So at the beginning, I had my Elon Musk, you know, 256 pictures of Elon. Um, and I want to be clear that pledging charity is the start of a journey for entrepreneurs, but it's not the destination. I remain as convinced as ever that social enterprise is the future. That was the hypothesis when I joined Founders Forum for Good, and it remains my belief today. It's the future, but it's not the present. So for us, bringing together the best tech entrepreneurs and giving them a common frame and a common language and, and the tools to give to charity means that they're more well positioned to start social businesses and to be more Elon. So that's my talk. I have time, and I want to ask questions. And you're going, or I want to answer questions, not ask them. So I want to have a discussion. So I, I intentionally kept this short-ish so that we can discuss. One on the, um, on the mentee. Let me see, here it is. How do you do due diligence? Uh, for or evaluate recipient charities? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so we have a team of researchers and we broadly follow effective altruist principles. Um, we look a bit like GiveWell except more bespoke. So we utilize ITN frameworks 
um, import importance tractability and neglectedness frameworks and look into cost effectiveness models and really try to dig into the data and say, um, what's the marginal value of donating our next dollar to this charity? And is it the best opportunity or are there better things? It's about looking non-intuitively and looking at counterfactual value and assessing whether or not this is the best use of our capital. So I get asked a lot um, about, like, I've had this thing that's affected me in my life. I'll give you an example. Um, my father died of uh, lung cancer last year, really unexpectedly. Um, and it was a pretty horrible experience and one that I wanted to get intimately involved in because, you know, you're affected by things. And so you decide that you need to affect them positively. I'd been giving to give directly, in my opinion, one of the best charities operating today. And I, ne I wanted to change that and start supporting cancer. Now, cancer research is significantly overfunded. And my next dollar is completely un unusable. It's going to go to an endowment. Cancer Research UK is the most well-funded charity in the country. And they can't use my money well. Um, treatment is expensive. And again, marginal value is quite low. And so if you're looking at the range of opportunities to affect cancer in a positive way, prevention is the best one. And so what does prevention look like? I can focus on the developed world where we already are preventing cancer in a lot of great ways because we eat well and we live well and we have access to health care in a way that most people don't. But the developing world has far more opportunity to do far more good. Um, so thankfully, I have a great research team and I told them, help me understand cancer better. And I, in, uh, I ended up giving to Project Healthy Children, which does micronutrient fortification and reduces the incidence of stomach cancer in the developing world really significantly. Um, so for me, affecting cancer wasn't about the common things that you would have thought. It wasn't the Google give to cancer charity. It was understanding what the data told, uh, told me and now what we tell our pledgers about actually what does doing good look like. How do we do the most good, not just some amount? Great. I think we have, we have time for one short question. Uh, I have one more on the screen. Do you see many founders in Sweden, Northern Europe? <laughs> um, we have been really actively trying to curate a community here in Stockholm. Um, not only because uh, Sweden tends to be a hub for great entrepreneurs, uh, but we've had a huge amount of exits. So you've seen liquidity in Klarna now just recently last week. PayPal bought iZettle for $2.2 billion in cash. You've seen Supercell out of Finland. Um, there's great entrepreneurs here. Um, and thankfully, um, Nicholas Adelberth from Klarna is a pledger. Um, but we've seen less uptake in Sweden than I would have thought. There's, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, the most important, maybe, is that there is no tax relief for donating to charity in Sweden. Um, now, I don't think our pledgers are donating because they get tax relief. It certainly helps. but. Um, if you're being taxed on money that you plan to give away to and supplement what the government is doing, um, it's sort of a bigger barrier to cross. And the whole notion of like being public about your giving, the signaling of it, is very counterintuitive here. Hmm. Um, and it's it's a trend that we're trying we're trying to bring a tiny bit of a sort of the American um, <laughs> way of thinking about philanthropy to Europe. So we I started this in London. Um, London is our home, but um, despite not having had presence in the U.S. until November of last year, $190 million of pledge values in the U.S., which is more than any other country, despite having a smaller number of pledgers. Mm. So we could do more um, in Sweden. Um, and so you should go tell your entrepreneur friends that they should <laughs> pledge. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck <laughs> on your future pledges. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. A little small thing from uh, SOS children's villages.